Well, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's Eve. It's so good to see you all, especially like Pastor Margarita said, those of you that are joining us online. Can we just take, can we just take a short moment to appreciate our musicians, our director, all of those that are working our tech and media services today? Can we thank them? We're, we're reminded that, that they don't always get uh, a Sunday off, and we are so thankful for the work that you all put in and the way that your gifts are serving the kingdom. And so, friends, it's a joy to be with you today. I'm Reverend Chris McClain. I've, I feel like I've met several of you all, um, but I'm making sure to introduce myself to everyone. I want to say I'm super proud of you. I'm proud of you for being here on New Year's Day. I'm proud of you for maybe being in a different venue. I'm proud of you being in the same venue at a different time, or maybe you're at home still in your socks. Nobody's judging you. We're glad that you're here and worshiping with us. It's a unique time to be here. It's a unique place. The, the feeling is unique, and so I want to capture that and say thank you. I'd like to start off today by telling you a secret. Do you think that you can keep it? <laughs> the secret is that I'm a romantic. And I don't mean that I like to watch romantic comedies or that Hallmark movies are what I move to. I, I don't even think that there's one perfect person out there for everyone. But I'm a romantic in the sense that I love to romanticize events. I love to romanticize happenings or concepts or gift giving or ideas. I, I love for this grand idea to come into being and for not just myself, but for multiple people to experience it. I long deeply for that epic, hallmark, New Year's Eve moment. You know, something that's experiential for everyone, it, it tingles the senses, it's emotional, so, you know, even the hardened of us, we can kind of tear up a little bit. I think it can really be summed up in the closing scene of one of our cinematic seasonal favorites, It's a Wonderful Life. And so I thought maybe we could, I think we've got that queued up, I thought that maybe we could watch that together just for a second. Let's see if it's there. To my big brother, George, the richest man in town. Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. How the boy clown. Many of you have a smile on your face because that brings back that beautiful nostalgia that you've watched time and time again. If you've never watched it, um, fine, let's get together and you can come to my home and we will sit down and watch It's a Wonderful Life. I want to challenge you to experience that. Now let me, let me of course get this out of the way because I'm a pastor and we have to do it. There is no biblical precedent for how an angel procures his or her wings via the tolling of the bells. If so, I would encourage us to sing Carol of the Bells every single Sunday, and this sermon would be about how all of us should now reinstate functioning grandfather clocks in our homes. But that's not the case. 
The truth is, is that there's something beautiful and nostalgic that, that I long for in my life, that I long for in your lives. And I bet some of you have that longing as well. Pastor Margarita prayed a beautiful prayer today that talked about, about reaching outside of our country and praying for others, others that have a deep longing for peace, others that have a deep longing for harmony, those that have a longing for restoration, for resurrection, and for newness. But no matter where you are today, I have a feeling that there's at least one place in your life that it doesn't all seem so wonderful. But before we get into that, I would love to have us join each other in prayer. Sages, leave your contemplations. Brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations. Ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship. Come and worship, come and worship the newborn king. Amen. As we step into a new year, no doubt many of you have expectations for what 2024 might hold. I thought today's scripture passage might be a warning for those of you who are too passive with your resolutions or for those who are too naive with your dreams. Today we're talking about expectations, unmet expectations. It's quite possible that you have some of those in 2023. I'd like to start by sharing a true story today, a story about a young man named John and his father. They were alive in the early 1900s. And so I'd like for you to do a little practice um, of simultaneously putting yourself in the father and in the son's position of this story. And I want you to see on your fingers, you don't have to hold them up, but on your fingers, if you can count how many expectations that are unmet in the story. Are you ready? John grew up in a fair childhood. Dad was a famed architect. John was imaginative and creative. He lived in Oak Park, Illinois, which later in 1976 would be named an all-American city. You ever felt like you lived in one of those? But John's life was rocked when his father, Frank, left his family for a client's wife. Like many children, he did his best to process, but it was still a rocky relationship. He spent two years in college at the University of Wisconsin. He would then spend a couple more years out on the West Coast doing odd jobs, kind of trying to find his way. Finally, he decided to become an architect, just like his father. And so he started creating a name for himself, and he heard about an Aus Austrian architect, Otto Wagner, and he decided that he wanted to go to Austria and become a disciple of this architect. Upon hearing this, in a response to when John asked for money to go to Austria, his father, Frank Lloyd Wright, said, I'd like to know what Otto Wagner can do for you that your father can't do. So at the age of 24, he joined his father, and this duo had the awesome opportunity to work together and design Tokyo's Imperial Hotel. The Imperial Hotel's design is incredible. It's designed specifically to survive some of the strongest earthquakes known to man, which it did in 1923. It used interlocking beams, which allows the hotel to, to sway and move, to, to flex, but to not fall down. However, like many families, a dispute over money would actually make the father and son duo separate before construction even began. Now, I don't know how many unmet expectations happened in the story, but I'm sure that you lost count. So let's recap. Father lets down son. College doesn't work out. Son moves thousands of miles away. Father welcomes son back into family business, but mm, with some strings attached. Father and son can't make finances work and they go their separate ways. Many of us have experienced unmet expectations at the hand of another. 
It might be that presumed values that we expect others to hold are not honored. Or maybe it's not that they're not honored, it's that they're intentionally disrespected. Oftentimes in those moments, we can feel like there is no future. We can feel like the, the very crevice of survival that we have to squeeze through would even crush the life out of us. But God at Christmas comes and speaks from the Gospel of John and reminds us that the light shines in darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Brothers and sisters, the darkness doesn't win just because we experience unmet expectations. Now, you may or may not believe that, so let's dive deeper into the season in which we find ourselves. The season of Christmas, don't forget, there's 12 days of it. We are still in it, okay? Some of y'all, not looking at my wife, have already packed up the Christmas tree, okay? And you've already, you're ready to move on. I know, I know we haven't actually done it, but it's really bugging her that it's still up, yes? Okay. So we're still in the season of Christmas, And it's a season that's very unique because it moves us from this indulgent consumption of gift giving to the self-reflection of the new year and her subsequent resolutions. Let's be honest now. We've consumed some really good things during this season. Sweet gifts, sweets, rich food, but we've also consumed some bad things. Too many sweets, too many gifts, and of course, fruitcake. It really is the worst, okay? And like in life, when we recognize brokenness or we feel like we're facing the worst, we often compare ourselves to others or we try to gain so much control that we don't allow the spirit to work. You know, the nation of Israel started with a notion kind of like that. Our scripture today comes from the end of a constant badgering of the Israelites that are calling out to God, we want a king, we want a king. Over here, we want a king. Verse 17 says says that the people of Israel started looking around and they see the things other kingdoms have, power, pomp, impressive armor and chariots. You see, they see might and prestige, but God sees the heart and the cost. God declares that if Israel places themselves under the authority of a king, that there will come a day (laughs) when you will cry out because of your king. And it's followed by an incredibly difficult passage for us to hear. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. As we sit in Christmas, we think about, man, that's, that's hard for me to stomach, Pastor. That's hard for me to hear that there might be a time when the Lord won't answer me. Because we think that when Jesus shows up with love and joy and peace and hope, that there will always be a happy outcome. But remember, the people want a king. The king is our answer All of our problems will be solved with a king, they say. But what you and I know is that what we want, our our natural inclinations, our sinful desires, our self-motivations do not always align with the kingdom of God. When we cry out for a different result for our marriage, when our business feels like it's going belly up, when our family relations are estranged, where, where things just don't seem to happen the way that I want them to happen, in the time frame that I want them to happen, when it just doesn't seem to all come together, sometimes the only thing we can do is to sit near the heart of God and to plead with him. Our scripture today makes it clear that we must cling to the heart of God and his will for our future. Don't cling to anything else, not to some concept, not to some pomp, not to some show, and definitely not to overconsumption. Instead, we find a Jesus, a savior, who comes into our lives as a child, and from the very beginning, we are sure of something.
we are assured that Jesus doesn't set expectations before us that he doesn't meet. Jesus is not only human, he's divine. He doesn't have selfish ambition within him. Instead, he has a deep and pursuing, consistent, persuasive desire for you as the most beloved of his creation. He tells us in scripture that there will be poor always. He tells us in scripture that you will have trouble. Scripture tells us that you and I will be and experience persecution for our faith. The expectations are made plain. And while doing so, he also lives into this moniker that we've talked about week after week, year after year, as we continue to celebrate Advent in the preparation for the coming of the Christ child. The Prince of Peace brings us to a place of conviction and grace, making us into the peacemakers of Matthew chapter five. The everlasting father calls us from our biological families in Mark chapter three and says that his family members are those who hear the word of God and do it. And in Luke six, the mighty God shares with us how meekness brings us to a place of our inheritance. You see, Israel's desire for, for a king would eventually be granted to them by God. And soon afterwards, Israel would experience all that God had warned them of. War, taxes, power struggle, and the king will even infringe on the ways that you give to God, both financially and in servitude. Did you notice when it said a tenth it will take a tenth. This is a direct attack on our relationship with God and with the kingdom. Finally, what we know is that the Israelites would even be exiled to Babylon. All this because their mindset was on that of an earthly kingdom instead of a heavenly kingdom. But in Christmas, we celebrate that heaven breaks forth. Good news comes for us all, to us all, and Jesus shocks the world, bringing the mindset of the kingdom, a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom that is not of this earth, but you can experience it today. Jesus comes to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed and the prisoner go free. Freedom, true freedom. It's what we all long for. Freedom from death, freedom from our past mistakes, freedom from our diagnosis, or freedom from the generational sins of our earthly families. Sins passed to us by those not listening to God's call of repentance or surrender on our lives. It was the same with the Israelites. What they thought was the answer was actually what enslaved their later generations. I know, I know that some of you have been waiting so long, so long to see God restore that which is broken. And while I can't say that it will return to the way that it was, I can say that in Jesus Christ, there is hope for what lies ahead. Because for those of us who are in Jesus Christ, tomorrow is assured. Because there's only three options for tomorrow for those of us that are followers of Jesus. Number one is that we wake up, Jesus comes back, and we stand in his presence. Number two, we go to sleep, we don't wake up, and then we find ourselves before God, telling God, thank you for being gracious to me because I don't deserve to be here. Or number three, we wake up with the opportunity to be healed of our unmet expectations and to tell the story of Jesus 
and his love. In order for all of this to take place, many of us still have some work to do. We must lay our unmet expectations at the foot of the cross or in the straw next to the manger. Because only in doing so can we acknowledge that the answer is not mightiness. The answer is not you and me getting any stronger. The answer is meekness. The answer is not in golden tiaras or horses or armies. Instead, the answer is in donkeys, thorny crowns, and small groups of the faithful. The answer is you and me walking alongside each other, seeking fulfillment in nothing else, nothing else, nothing else but Jesus. You see, God doesn't want us to romanticize an event. He doesn't want us to romanticize a relationship. He doesn't want us to romanticize our experience in the world. Instead, he just wants the relationship with us. He wants for our hearts to be focused on nothing else but Jesus. He sends Jesus so that we might look to nothing else because the person of Jesus who is not only a person but divine, who is perfect, who is the sacrifice for our sins, all of that is romantic enough for us. And so God's desire for a relationship with us can be summed up when Jesus says that anything else, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy But I came that you might have life, that you might have it abundantly, that you might have it to the full. Do you remember our story in the beginning of the young man named John? John Lloyd Wright, the son of Frank Lloyd Wright? Of course, after his separation from his father, he found himself in financial straits again. But he used this idea of the interlocking beams that they developed for the Tokyo Imperial Hotel to create one of the country's favorite toys, Lincoln Logs. Because the swaying of the rambunctiousness of children would would allow the logs to move but not fall down. And so what we realize is that one of Out of many of the expectations that were unmet, God was still working for good. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is doing that work in each of us today and every day. In closing, instead of us fumbling for the words of old Lang Syne, looking for some romantically superficial moment, I'd like to invite you to open your hymnals to page 710 there in the pew backs in front of you. As we think about resolutions and the birth of a new year, let us join together sharing the words of another famous John, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. In his covenant prayer that you find printed there, he outlines what a life totally surrendered to the movement of the Holy Spirit looks like. These words are so true to the spirit of the gospel that they can even be found on the wall just outside of the sanctuary. So what I'd like to invite you to do is I'd like to invite you to stand. Let us proclaim this with one another as we head into a new year. You'll also find the words on on your screen. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, 
and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we join together in our closing hymn.